Okay, thank you. Now let's, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer, shall we, and ask God's blessing on our fellowship. Father, we thank you for this time that we can share together. Uh, it's so good to uh, be a part of your family and to fellowship not only with you, but with your children. And Lord, we pray that you'd just be with us tonight and pray that you would use uh, the things that are said in some way to honor and glorify our wonderful Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, I'm to share my testimony as I understand it, so I'll tell you basically uh, my background and how I happened to be involved in Mormonism. Uh, my great-grandparents were pioneers here in the Salt Lake Valley, and uh, uh, so it was in the family. My grandparents were involved in Mormonism. My parents were involved in Mormonism, married in the temple up in Logan, and I was sealed in there. In, uh, Actually, I think they were married in Salt Lake Temple, and we were sealed up in the Logan Temple. But uh, at any rate, I grew up uh, in Mormonism, really not knowing anything about anything other than Mormonism. And so <clears throat> uh, we had moved into western Colorado, and uh, uh, there were a number of Mormons there, but not like in Utah. And so I was sharing my Mormon faith with my friends even in junior high school. And as far as I know, uh, it was uh, when I was in the seventh grade, uh, my first convert went into the Mormon church because of my sharing what I believed and so forth. And of course, my message was all about Joseph Smith and his visions. At any rate, I continued to uh, share my faith of uh, uh, Mormonism with those that I came in contact with. And so when I was in high school, I met some uh, Christian young people, I thought, they look like good prospects for the Mormon church. And so uh, they lived the same direction from the high school that I did, and we walked back and forth sometimes together. And in the process, we uh, talked about our beliefs and so forth, and as we were doing that, um, at one point, the, the discussion came around to what did we anticipate would happen after this life was over? And when I said, well, uh, my ultimate goal was Godhood, uh, they looked a little shocked at me. They wondered what in the world I was talking about. At any rate, um, they challenged me on some of the things that I was saying, and I thought, you know, I'm going to be going on a mission here shortly, and I really have not read the uh, scriptures like I should have, and I, I need to really get better acquainted with my church doctrine and so forth. And so, as a result of that conversation, I thought I was going to get answers. I, I started reading the standard works, and I thought the one that would answer all my questions was the Book of Mormon. And uh, talk about a real letdown. Um, I read it all the way through and was more confused when I finished than when I started, because the Book of Mormon doesn't really teach Mormon doctrines, and it gets right down to it. And uh, so I. Uh, went on to read the Doctrine and Covenants and the Pearl of Great Price and the Bible. And uh, um, I didn't really have a, a lot of problems reading through the Old Testament, uh, the history part and so forth. Some of the, you know, in uh, Leviticus, it, it gets a little tedious sometimes. <laughs> Some of those other things, I didn't know what all was going on. but. Uh, when I got to the New Testament, I didn't really have much problem um, with any of it until I um, uh, got to the book of Acts. And uh, I began to see something that I had not up to that point seen. Uh, in Acts 5.42, uh, for example, it says, Daily in the temple and every house, you cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. In Acts 8 and verse 5, it says Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Uh, in the same chapter, Acts chapter 8 and verse 35, the Ethiopian is reading uh, in Isaiah 53 and he doesn't understand it. And Philip uh, comes along and asks him, do you understand what you're reading? He said, well, how can I unless somebody explains it? And so it says in verse 35 of Acts chapter 8, but Philip began at that same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And you see that throughout Acts. Acts 9, 20, Saul of Tarsus has just been converted. And in verse 20 of Acts 9, it says straightway he preached Christ in the synagogue, but he's the Son of God. And I, I realized that wasn't my message. 
my message was Joseph Smith and his um, first vision, how he saw God the Father and Jesus Christ, and then after that he saw uh, Moroni, and uh, then he saw John the Baptist, and then he saw Peter, James, and John, and so forth. And it was, it was that story that I was sharing in uh, trying to share my Mormon faith, all of these visions and so forth that Joseph Smith had. And so it was long uh, during this time that I uh, had been challenged. Uh, we still lived up in the mountains in Colorado at that time, and uh, I used to go out uh, um, in the mountains, in, in the woods, and kneel down and pray, and I was really expecting God to send an angel or reveal himself or something. If, it, if he could do that for Joseph Smith, why couldn't he do it for me? That was the way I looked at it. I never did get an angel or anything else. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I continued to read through the New Testament. And uh, uh, after I finished Acts, of course, the next book is Romans. And, you know, I didn't really... Uh, have any background for justification by faith. I didn't even know what justification was talking about, but uh, I was reading through there and there, there was a lot of it that I thought, boy, that, that sounds um, contrary to what I've been taught. You know, uh, Romans 3 talks about how uh, by the law is the knowledge of sin, and then it talks about how uh, the wage of sin is death and, and so forth, and I thought, boy, I don't, I don't care for some of that stuff. <laughs> and at any rate, um, I read on through uh, one time through the, the New Testament. I was going through it again, and uh, I began to see something that um, I hadn't seen before. I was asking God for some manifestation, some, some way that I would know that uh, uh, I was okay with him, that, that I was going to be accepted. Um, I grew up, of course, uh, in a Mormon home. I remember in the bedroom we had a, a picture of Moroni, a pyramid of Joseph Smith, and then um, of uh, Peter, James, and John appearing to him and so forth. And it was all that kind of, kind of mystic sort of stuff that I was anticipating. And uh, yet as I was reading the New Testament, I somehow realized that peace with God is what I really wanted. And uh, you may recall that Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what justification by faith was yet. I did have some idea about uh, peace with God. And uh, I asked God to give me that peace. Now, uh, I still was a Mormon at that point, still believed what I'd been taught. But as I uh, prayed uh, that prayer and as I continued my study, uh, there were a lot of things that had developed over that uh, period of, uh, well, it was over a year that I was reading the standard works and, and began to read some other stuff too, uh, some of the church stuff. And uh, I realized that the Bible had a different message than Mormonism. Somehow that message came through and Along about that period of time, there was a, a small pamphlet given to me. Um, I think it was Mormonism Under the Searchlight. Maybe some of you have seen it by Beter Wolf. Uh, I think Erdman's published it years ago. It didn't have any references, but it pointed out a lot of errors in Mormonism, and that made me question some more. Um, but at any rate, uh, what ultimately happened is I read uh, through Romans, I asked God to give me that peace, and as I uh, got into uh, 1 John uh, chapter 5, in verse 9, it says, If you can believe the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. It goes on in verses 11 and 12 to say that this is the, the witness, or this is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He that has the Son has life, and he that has not the Son of God has not life. Uh, and then verse 13, these things that are written on you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, you might believe on the name of the Son of God. And I began to see, uh, just, we're still 
somewhat dim, but I was beginning to see that biblical Christianity revolved around Christ. It had to do with a relationship, not a religion. It had to do with uh, what I did with Jesus Christ, whether or not I believed in him and what he did and so forth. And uh, so I began to study the Bible more intently. I went back and looked at the Mormon scriptures and uh, I remember the first time through, uh, I had a number of questions as I read some of that stuff. I, I couldn't help but notice uh, the Trinity is right there, you know, in the, the uh, testimony of the three witnesses. It concludes that way. Uh, I saw it again in Second Nephi um, um, 3121, uh, Mormon 7, 7, Alma 1144, and so forth, uh, teaching that. And God's that great spirit, you know, uh, and those kind of teachings that are contrary to Mormonism. So I had all kinds of questions, and then uh, there were other things that uh, bothered me. I, I remember the first time I uh, studied carefully uh, through Second Nephi chapter 28, uh, where Jesus supposedly had, uh, after he was resurrected over in uh, Palestine, he came to America and preached the, the same gospel here, and uh, did it in the same King James English too. <laughs> and, and, uh, at any rate, uh, the thing that uh, uh, I began to, to wrestle with in my mind was he picked these 12 apostles and three of them never died. Now, I don't know about some of you that have Mormon background, but when I was young, I used to hear stories about the three Nephites, how they were helping different people, and they were always changing somebody's flat tire or something like that, and they were never preaching the gospel. But according to 3 Nephi 28, that's what they were supposed to do. They were to preach the gospel, bring souls to Jesus, baptize them, add them to the church until Jesus returns. That's what it says. And I thought, how can they be doing that if there was a universal apostasy while they were here? And <laughs> so I began to ask that question of people, and uh, Mormon people, uh, how do you reconcile that concept Third Nephi 28, with these guys supposedly on the earth preaching the gospel, baptizing, adding them to the church, and so forth, and, and there are great multitudes of every nation, kindred, and tongue, and people that they're doing that with. And not only that, but, uh, uh, you know, section 7 in the Doctrine and Covenants says that John the uh, uh, Apostle never died too. So you have four apostles. And I've used that a few times just to get a conversation going. Uh, one time years ago when uh, I was still pretty much a fresh missionary here in Utah, I got on the train headed for Chicago back east and, and the train car I got into was loaded with Mormon missionaries. And so I thought, well, uh, they're going to be after me if I, if I don't get going for something. So I asked the one next to me, uh, if they still taught the concept of universal apostasy, that from the time of the Apostles of Christ down to Joseph Smith, there was no true church on the earth, no gospel, no Christians. And they assured me that, yes, that's uh, certainly still um, the doctrine of the church. And so I brought up this passage in 3 uh, uh, Nephi and, and um, chapter 28 and, and section 7 of the Doctrine of Covenants, and I said, uh, I'd like to know what the official answer is. How does the church really answer that? Because I, I haven't found anybody that can answer it for me. Well, the interesting thing was that the missionaries uh, had a little huddle up in the front end of the railroad car <laughs> talking about that. And then they came back uh, to me uh, and said, that's a, that's a very interesting question that you've asked. And well, we don't seem to have an answer. But if Joseph Fielding Smith were here, he could answer it. <laughs> and I said, well, could you give me the answer? And uh, they, they assured me they would if I would give them my name and address, and I did, and I'm still waiting. <laughs> still didn't answer it. And then the, the one who had been sitting next to me, I had shared a little bit more uh, with them, and, and uh, uh, they uh, um, said to me, um, by the way, um, what do you know about Mormonism? And I knew the next question was, wouldn't you like to know more? The golden questions, you know. And so I said, well, before 
you asked that other question, maybe you would like to know a little bit more about me. And so I just share briefly that my great grandparents were Mormon pioneers, my grandparents were Mormons, my parents were Mormons, and I was too. And the one next to me said, Well, I thought you said you were a Baptist missionary. I said, I, I am. And it just got so quiet for a while, and one of them said, well, why did you change? And I thought, boy, this is a real open door. <laughs> and so for just a few moments, I shared with them how I had found Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, and I had peace with God that Mormons and there no other religion could give to me. This came from a person, from the person of Jesus Christ. And... Uh, from that point till I got off the train in Chicago, I almost had to run to catch those guys. They wouldn't talk to me. <laughs> but it was, uh, it was interesting, but it, uh, at least I gave them something to think about. And they did hear uh, um, the salvation message because I shared it with them. Um, <clears throat> and anyway, I did uh, um, accept Christ as Savior after uh, studying the Bible and uh, I'm sure, like some of you, I held on to some Mormon beliefs unwittingly. I didn't know it. Uh, it took me quite a while to go through it. Um, uh, not too long after I, I became a Christian, I did start uh, going to Bible college. I began to learn a little bit more about the Bible and so forth. Uh, then I, I continued to study on my own. And then I went on to seminary and... Uh, was then later appointed, actually 50 years ago this year, we were appointed as missionaries to come to Utah, wow. and that's when we began our, our ministry here. Wow. Um, and for the first 17 years that I was here as a missionary to Mormons, I was still on the rolls. And uh, I uh, had found out along the way that uh, the only way I could get out in, the, in that period of time was through excommunication. There were, you couldn't resign, and that was not a, an option. And so I decided just to leave my name alone and see how long it would take them. Well, at that time I was doing a lot of tracking around Temple Square. I don't know if any of you heard of Grant Cure, but uh, Grant was a stake official of some kind, and he was going through some real questioning at the time. And he printed up a little pamphlet, uh, well, a few pages, uh, on my old hand crank mimeograph that uh, questioned the um, book of Abraham, and then he said he was afraid to hand it out. And I said, well, I'll help you. So <laughs> we went down and handed that out. I, I read it. It was factual. It didn't really have the gospel. I would like to have had it uh, get more of the gospel with it, but what it said was factual and accurate. Was this before or after the papyri was given to the church? Pardon? Was this before or after the papyri was given to the church? This was before. Okay. Yeah. Um, at any rate, um, <clears throat> we uh, handed out those papers, and uh, it was rather interesting. <laughs> that's, uh, I think that's the only time I was, I, I was wearing a necktie, and I was picked right up off of the, my feet by my necktie. <laughs> <laughs> the guy about seven feet tall, he was angry at, at what we were doing. But at any rate, um, uh, we did get all of it handed out, and the next week, both Grant Hewitt and I got summons to court. <laughs> and uh, I said, I'm going to go. And uh, at that time, I was serving as chairman of the Evangelical Ministers in Salt Lake, and, and uh, I was pastoring a little church. So I, I told my congregation, as well as the, the evangelical ministers, we met that week. And so uh, some of them wanted to go to the excommunication, too. And I said, well, the only way you can go is as uh, character witnesses. You can't get in otherwise. And I can't guarantee that you will anyway. Uh, as it turned out, why we had, uh, I don't remember, 35 or 6 people or something like that that came with me. <coughs> and they were planning on holding the the excommunication in the bishop's office. Well, there were too many of us, so they had to move to a little auditorium. <laughs> and uh, then they, they asked if I would uh, yeah. plead guilty to the charges. And I said, well, no, you summoned me to come to this court. I want you to prove the, your charges. And one of the charges was that I was serving as an ordained Baptist minister. And I knew that there was nobody there that could prove one way or the other whether I was or wasn't. <laughs> I was the only one that would have any evidence 
uh, along that line. So um, they looked at one another and uh, uh, they said, well, you do want to be excommunicated, don't you? And I said, well, I don't care. I said, you've had my name for at least 17 years after I left, so um, if you want to keep it, why, that's fine. You know, and they looked at one another. <laughs> And uh, <clears throat> then I said, well, uh, the interesting thing is nobody has asked why I left. Don't you want to know? No, we don't really want to <laughs> <laughs> And I, so I just took the bull by the horns and decided to give a little testimony anyway. And I'm surprised they didn't shut me up, but I did talk for probably 10 minutes or so and shared with them uh, what I had found as I came to know Christ as Savior, and I found too many problems in Mormonism, realized it was not from God, and so I had put my trust in Christ and Christ alone. And uh, so I did get notice after the excommunication trial that I had been excommunicated, <laughs> and uh, I figured it was a foregone conclusion anyway. But uh, So that's uh, kind of in a, in a nutshell what happened to me as far as uh, why I'm here today. All the way through Bible College and Seminary, I, uh, I was active. Uh, I was pastoring a little church when I met my wife while I was still in Bible College. I went to seminary. We started a church and, and so forth. I, I uh, felt God's call on my heart to do ministry. And I kept wondering, you know, where would be the best place? And I couldn't get Utah out of my mind, actually, because I was familiar with it. We'd been through Utah. Uh, a lot, uh, and I knew there were not that many uh, Bible-believing churches. In fact, I think I could a number on um, a few more fingers than that, the number of Bible-believing churches in the Salt Lake Valley at the time that we came here. Um, <clears throat> when I was here with my parents as a young person, I didn't know of any. Uh, all I knew about was Mormonism. And um, so I realized there was a uh, a great mission field. I knew something about Mormonism. Uh, I probably learned more coming out of Mormonism than I knew all the years that I was active in the church. I thought, uh, I, thought I knew the basics, but like many people, um, it was too basic to know very much. You know. I, I'm reminded of a, a lady that called me a few years ago from St. George that uh, uh, had been in the Mormon church for 30 years. She had been teaching primary and so forth. And, and she'd gotten a hold of, I don't whether it was my book or some tapes or something I had done. But at, at any rate, uh, she called me. And, <clears throat> and um, uh, as we were talking, uh, she said, you know, I don't, I don't think I ever heard that our church teaches that God was once a man and men could become gods. And I said, you never heard that? She said, no, I don't think so. You never heard the little couplet, as man is, God once was, and as God is, man may be? Oh, yeah. Well, I said, what does it mean? And it got really quiet. <laughs> Finally, she said, is that what it means? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's what it says. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Who was that, Amar? Pardon? Who was the person? It wasn't Ruth Seavey, was it? Pardon? Wasn't Ruth Seavey that... Uh, no, I don't think so. No, because we met her in St. George. Oh, did you? Yeah, uh, yeah I, I, uh, I remember that name, but I don't think that was... Uh, the name. I, I'd have to look back to my records now, <laughs> but uh, but I've had a number of cases like that uh, where people have been in the church for a long time, just like I was, and I, I really didn't know as much as I thought I knew. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm thankful that um, those young people uh, challenged me uh, back when I was still in high school, and I'm thankful that the Holy Spirit prodded me on to uh, read um, the Mormon scriptures, because that gave me a reason to leave once I uh, saw that it uh, taught some of the things that it taught, and um, then the Holy Spirit prodded me and helped me to understand what I was reading when I uh, read the New Testament. Um, but anyway, uh, as a result of that, uh, I became a Christian, uh, I've been in ministry for a number of years, and uh, wouldn't wouldn't change a thing. And I still have it. As you can probably guess, I'm beyond retirement age, and I'm still serving. I I love to do what I do. I still love to talk to Mormons, and I try to uh, 
understand where they're coming from because I was sincere as the young person. I just didn't know any different. You know? And I needed somebody to prod me, get me to study it, to think. And uh, that's what I try to do when I talk with them is to, uh, and to share with them the simplicity of the gospel. It's in Christ alone.